Welcome back to the program. My next guest is James Patterson, Liberal Senator from our Melbourne studio. Senator, thanks very much for your time. Uh, I believe you're there somewhere at least, uh, just looking at that screen. There he is. Uh, I knew you were there somewhere. Um, let's start on Bill Shorten or Anthony Albanese and what has happened here on John Setkin as Anthony Albanese gets some credit for acting where perhaps Bill Shorten was less willing to do so. Anthony Albanese faces a real test of leadership today. If by the end of the day, John Setka is still holding down one of the most important jobs in Labor politics in Australia, then Mr Albanese's leadership will be shown to be a complete paper tiger. Uh, he and his friends in the union movement like Sally McManus have all the power necessary to remove him from the CFMEU in Victoria if that is in fact what they actually want to do. But the problem that Anthony Albanese has is, instead of from the many misdemeanours he could have chosen from, from Mr John Setka, uh, he has chosen to hang the reason for his need to be ex expelled from the Labor Party and step down at the CFMEU, uh, that he's made some comments about, um, uh, about Rosie Batty, which has been denied. Now, you and I don't know whether he made them or not. He denies them. Anthony Albanese said he said mm. them. Instead, uh, Mr Albanese could have chosen from his wanton record of criminality. He could have chosen the fact that uh, he'd made threats against public servants and their families and children, uh, but instead he's just chose to hang it on these comments. Well, he can only act on what has happened, really, since he came to power. When you say they've got all the power to get rid of him, what, what do you mean by that? Because from any conversations I've had, that's not actually the case. Well, my understanding, Tom, is that the CFMEMU in Victoria can move a motion uh, that he has brought the union into disrepute, and if that motion is successful, he'd be removed uh, as a union leader. Um, so that option is available to them. That would have to be from rank and file members, though. So how can well, Anthony Albanese do that? Well, we've been reading in the papers this morning that the deputy uh, in Victoria, Sean Reardon, has lost confidence in Mr Setka. Um, he's in a position to act on this. Sally McManus, as a head of the union movement in Australia, is in a position to act on this. If they choose not to, I think it will be very revealing. But in terms of the responsibility for Anthony Albanese? Well, he should be out there today uh, calling on his friends and allies in the union movement, who he's closely aligned with, to actually step up and take action. Of course, one of the problems that Anthony Albanese faces is if he chose to get rid of John Setka because of his criminality, uh, where would that leave all the other union officials, uh, including those on the national executive of the Labor Party, like Michael Ravbar, who's a union leader in the CFMEU in Queensland, who's made okay. similar... OK, we, we'll um, just avoid talking about uh, the prior convictions just for, for legal reasons, uh, James Patterson. Look, I take your point about Anthony Albanese uh, needing to make that call. We'll see if it happens. Let's move on to press freedom... There is obviously some acknowledgement within government now that there could be changes in this area, a review. We'll see what form it takes. But is this tacit acknowledgement that perhaps over the past couple of decades that balance hasn't always been achieved on security versus press freedom? My view, Tom, is that a review is a very sensible and prudent thing. Uh, legitimate concerns have been raised over the last week about press freedom. And those concerns, what they really go to the heart of, if we think about it carefully, is the law itself and the way that the law is drafted. Um, in the incidents of the warrants executed last week, it's actually the criminal code uh, that it relates to rather than national security law explicitly. But I think uh, wrapped up in all of this is a broader concern about press freedom and the way in which our laws uh, impact on that. So I think a, a, rude, a, a review is a very sensible thing to do and I, I strongly support that. And our parliamentary system is really well designed right. to do that. It's really well set up to do that. Yeah. News Corp's uh, Head of Government Relations and Corporate Affairs, Campbell Reid, says we've, we've had many submissions already. We know what the issues are. Advocates from the media, from the Law Reform Council as well, have told the government for many years what's wrong with things. Why can't they be acted upon rather than wait for another review, another couple of years, who knows how many more police raids? Well, Tom, um, if the... If Mr Reid and others are willing to put forward the specific amendments to the specific laws, they're able to demonstrate that that has broad community support, they're able to demonstrate that that would be an appropriate balance uh, against national security, or without having a parliamentary inquiry which is set up to test those things, um, I'll be very impressed. But I actually think the sensible thing here to do is to go through the proper parliamentary process. I don't think that shortcutting the parliamentary process is going to assist. Um, I appreciate that people uh, want to see this acted on uh, swiftly, but their best chance of securing the changes that they actually want is for it to follow through an orthodox parliamentary process and that will tease out all of these issues what? and perhaps uncover issues that we might not have anticipated. 
What about plucking out just one then last year when legislation was passed which included a carve out for journalists on public interest but none for whistleblowers despite advocacy? Is the need for that pretty obvious and straightforward? Well, we do have robust protection for whistleblowers in Australia, Tom, and I know some people are suggesting that we should go even further with that. But I think there is very good reason why we draw a distinction between a whistleblower on the one hand and a journalist on the other. They do have very different roles. Uh, whistleblowers, for example, when they sign their employment contract to go and work for the government, voluntarily sign up to a whole lot of requirements about confidentiality and secrecy. And if they choose to break them, well, of course, there are consequences for them. Uh, in the case of many whistleblowers, though, uh, they, do, they choose not to follow the, um, the processes that we have in place for whistleblowers. They don't go to the designated uh, officials to make their concerns known. Uh, sometimes they just go straight to the media. That's not uh, the way that whistleblower protections are set up in Australia, and I can't imagine that that would change it, yeah, in a it, material way. Well, we're not necessarily talking about the way that it works, because, yes, they're meant to raise it internally, first of all, which we're hearing in one particular case... They've attempted to do so, to go internally, even go to the police, and that was ignored, and that was when David McBride said he went public. But ignoring even all of that, it's about where the protection is for the Public Interest Disclosure Act passed by Labor in 2013. I mean, that doesn't really have much of a carve-out in a broad public interest sense, for example, on secret documents. So that's a missing avenue, isn't it? And if there's no protection for them, the story's not going to get to the journalist. Potentially, Tom, but I think we really do need to test all these things in the appropriate way through a parliamentary inquiry because we are dealing with competing priorities here. Um, we don't want to send a signal uh, to the public service uh, and the people who work within it that the voluntary agreements that they've entered into to protect confidentiality um, are, not, uh, are not going to be enforced, uh, that they can take it upon themselves to declassify documents and make them freely available to the public. I mean, that, is not, that would not be a good thing uh, for Australia or Australians. Having said that, of course, um, whistleblower protections are important and press freedom is important and we do need to find the right balance. And that's why I'm an advocate of a parliamentary inquiry. And what about the issue of the, the raids, uh, the warrants themselves to conduct the raids? And this is an issue with getting warrants in a lot of different areas. They're done in secret, effectively. They're not done with anyone knowing about them in terms of the journalist organisation and being able to contest them. Is that an issue? Because seemingly they're going to be signed off without and really testing them at all in a court or even the registrar has happened here. Mm. This is something I'd like the committee to closely examine, Tom, because it's been publicly reported that in the case of the warrants being executed on the ABC, uh, that the warrant was obtained from a Queanbeyan court registrar, um, whereas uh, last year in the national security legislation changes that we passed, particularly in relation to metadata and foreign interference, uh, if a journalist is going to be uh, raided or a warrant is going to be executed on them uh, more accurately, uh, that it also requires the sign-off of the Attorney-General, which is obviously a much higher level of scrutiny, a much higher uh, a level of accountability. Um, so that discrepancy between the criminal code, uh, on the one hand, and our national security changes mm. passed last year, is something I think we need to look at carefully. So on the face of it, that would be a, a, a change that you could well support, broadening that? Well, I don't want to preempt an inquiry that um, has not yet even started, let alone heard evidence, Tom. But I think, as a general principle, uh, making consistent across our laws the standard of protection that we have for journalists in our laws uh, it seems like a sensible thing to, to me. All right. Uh, I want to get on to something else that's big in your town, I know. Uh, a little bit of a different tack is AFL fans being booted out for... Well, it's being termed as abuse. Here are three of the things that apparently have happened to get fans evicted. One calling an umpire a bald-headed flog, another one a green maggot, and the latest one apparently for barracking too loudly. Now, I'm hating the brawls that have been going on in football this year, but is this crackdown going too far? I think most Australians would agree there's a pretty clear difference between really antisocial behaviour that no one wants to see at a sporting contest, you know, the racial vilification and that sort of thing, that's clearly um, beyond the pale, yep. to more enthusiastic barracking and, yes, a bit of ribbing of the umpires. I mean, I think it's pretty ingrained in the Australian culture, uh, part of our disrespect for authority, uh, that we have a bit of a go at an umpire when we feel the decision hasn't gone our way. And clearly there is a place for that in an acceptable, so socially acceptable way, um, while we can take action on the more... Um, untoward, out-of-control behaviour that we don't want to see around in a family game. And I know you're an erudite gentleman, but if the Tigers were a few goals behind in the last quarter and you happened to utter green maggot, you wouldn't want to be escorted from the ground? 
When I was younger, I have been known to utter uh, phrases such as that at the football, Tom. Um, I'm, of course, you know, uh, public official now, a public figure. I have to be uh, much more circumspect at, uh, at public events. But, I mean, it, it's, it's innate, I think, in every sporting fan when you feel like the game's in the balance and a decision goes against you, um, that, of course, the umpire must be uh, blind or otherwise impaired um, and made a bad decision. I mean, it, it, it's kind of letting out that steam, I think, is a pretty healthy, normal thing in a sporting contest. Amen to that. I tell you what, if that's the standard that you can't uh, get fired up at a football game and when you go into public office, it's not for me. James Patterson, thanks for your time. <laughs> thanks, Tom.